Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Weird Shit. So this one uh, took a little longer than usual, I apologize for that. Um, there's a good reason for it. As you might have noticed, the title is sort of um, crossed out. And uh, normally this one is going to be called The Triple Threat, uh, which talks about sort of large, medium and small details in artwork and how you can achieve certain things um, by using uh, a certain met methodology, basically. Now, I was at um, the Blender conference and Gab Alexandrov actually did a really good um, uh, presentation about it. So I'd recommend that you check that out. And I felt like it didn't really need another, I uh, didn't really need a full Weird Shit episode. He mentions a lot of Neil Blevins stuff. Um, he's a really great artist that has done a lot of write-ups about CG and making CG art and making things look good. So um, if you just Google Blender Conference 2017 and you know look through Gleb's um, presentation, he actually explains it really well. Um, so that's one of the reasons it took a little longer and uh, I've been busy as well. So today is all gonna be about magnificent meshes. So uh, I'm actually going to use a couple of pieces of art that I did recently to talk about some of the techniques that I use when it comes to meshes and how you can think outside of the box. So let me just grab uh, this one. So we'll start with either this one or this one first. Um, a lot of it is actually, yeah, a lot of the same things can be said about both of them. So I don't know if I'm going to do both of them, but I will include both files for you to download and have a look at. I'm going to start with this one first. So this is a very simple one. And I just want to talk very quickly about how you can achieve sort of this look and how I look at meshes and decimation and things like that. Um, and I use them as tools rather than just uh, a decimation type of thing. So let's see if we can open up this guy here. And we just have the scene, uh, very basic, basic, nothing special. But I just want to talk a little bit about how I build some of these. So as you might notice, the topology on this is really, really crazy. And um, I like to think as uh, these decimation tools as really interesting tools. So I'm gonna turn this off so I don't spoil a surprise. Um, I'm just gonna go through this step by step so you get an idea of how, um, how I approach some of this stuff. And basically I start out with a regular human base mesh. Um, I use the uh, Manuel Bastioni Lab um, add-on as I might've mentioned before. It's a really great add-on if you haven't used it yet. Take a look at it, it's free, and you can just generate meshes of people in Blender. I'm gonna turn off the eyes here for a second as well. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. The really cool thing about uh, remesh and decimate modifiers is you can really throw any kind of mesh into them and they, they give you some really interesting results. So I was messing around with this one night and I threw on a displace modifier, threw in uh, a texture, and I don't actually know if that texture has anything in it. Yeah, it's just a black texture figure. Um, but it did something really funny to the mesh and I found it kind of hilarious. Um, and I thought it looked kind of interesting. And I wondered if I could do something with it and actually get a proper mesh out of it. So I worked with the remesh modifier a lot. And the cool thing was, um, even though, you know, we start with this really crazy sort of weird looking thing, the remesh modifier can give you really interesting results. And from there, um, I sort of felt like it looked sort of like an orger, ogre or, um, or an orc or something like that, and uh, sort of went with it. And then I used the um, decimate modifier as well on top of it. Now, um, before I get into the decimate modifier, the remesh modifier is a really, really interesting one. Um, it has multiple modes and you can do all kinds of stuff with it. And I really like it because it gives you really unexpected results for meshes sometimes. And you can do some, like I said, really cool things with it. So by default, it's set to sharp. And um, yeah, it just gives you a really sharp approximation of the mesh. And as you saw before, it doesn't matter if it's a really weird one, it's always gonna try and make one continuous volume from it. Um, you can see sort of the smaller details are, are getting lost, like the feet and the hands. And you can do some like really creepy stuff with this as well, I guess. But the higher that you put the octree depth, depth, the more it's gonna approximate the original mesh shape. So just messing with this and then messing with the scale over here, you can get different kinds of um, shapes and different variations. And I really like that. You can even mess around with the sharpness, bring it down, push it up. Um, there's really so many options that you can do. Turn on smooth shading or turn it off. I left it off for now and um, you can actually have multiple pieces. So if you have a mesh with multiple different disconnected pieces inside of it, um, turning remove disconnected pieces off will actually preserve those and you can play with the threshold as well. 
Now I didn't need them, I just wanted the face because uh, I like the uh, the weird mesh that came out of it and I want to do sort of a portrait from it. Then um, after that I use the decimate modifier and the decimate modifier might be one of my favorite modifiers in Blender. Um, for the most part, so I'm just going to create like a regular, all right, just a round cube and subdivide it a few times. And for the most part, the decimate modifier seems kind of boring. I'm just going to put this local here. And um, what it does, it's just going to collapse your mesh. Maybe I'm going to turn on wires here so we can see what we're doing. So it's just going to try and collapse down your mesh and uh, basically bring down the amount of faces. And collapse is a very simple function. Um, it triangulates it and you can really force it to be triangulated as well. And it's just very simple. And to get low poly looks, you can use this with a, with a bit of hacks and stuff. And you can even pipe a um, <clears throat> vertex group into it. So let's say if I grab these top four faces and I add them into a mask vertex group, just assign it. Uh, the cool thing is you can actually just try and decimate that one. So you can get really interesting results um, just from there. So even now we have a really nice cube, I'll turn off triangulate, really nice round cube that's subdivided, yet at the top it's going to start uh, decimating it. So you can do some very sort of um, local decimation by painting in vertex groups and doing really interesting things with it. And then the factor is the factor of which it um, uses that vertex group, you mess with it. And you can also turn on symmetry so you have uh, symmetry in your decimation over a certain axis. Um, so again, you can work with this to do all kinds of crazy weird effects. And even though it's meant to you know, grab a really high poly mesh and do, um, do some simplifying to it, I really like it because it does some really cool things. Now, the second function of this is the unsubdivide. And something that I find really interesting about this one is for every odd number, you actually get a, um, the polygons will actually turn about 90 degrees and you get sort of a cross pattern in them instead. So you can look at this, if we look at a plane, for example, uh, just move this over for a second and subdivide it. There we go. So we cut it 10 times and I'll turn on the wire here as well. Draw all edges. So what you can do um, is if we were to decimate this, there we go, and set it to unsubdivide, you can see now we get this cool cross pattern. So you can do some really interesting things to meshes with this. And you can even keep going. You can see though on the edges it tends to be a little weird uh, once you get down to a lot of iterations. But still, like this could be a really interesting way to do something. Um, you know, if you add a mo wireframe modifier to this, you get a really interesting pattern that you might be able to use for something. So, um, something I really like. And the cool thing is if you want, um, let's say I like this, but I want to have um, one subdivision less, you can use a subdivision modifier to actually control that. And then, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of. Um, I know we don't have enough polygons, so it's going to kind of weird. So you could actually control this or bring it up to three and then bring this down to three. And that way you can just completely control it and do some really interesting things with it. So the decimate modifier um, has another really, really great feature. And I'm just going to go out of this mode and throw these two away because we don't really need them. And that is one of my favorite ones, uh, which makes it a really interesting one. And that is the planar, um, the planar setting. Now I'm just gonna go, actually I'm gonna see if I can do something else. I'm gonna create another round cube and start this from scratch so you can see what's going on. Um, let's say I have another subdivision modifier in here. I'm just gonna smooth this out. And uh, I'm gonna throw on all this place. and just have, let's say, distorted noise and bring up the size a little bit. So now we get this really weird sort of shape, but um, I wanted to create this a sort of a more simple object so you can see what the decimate, the decimate modifier actually does. The cool thing is it's going to look for um, an angular, uh, it, it has an angle limit. So basically it's gonna look for polygons that have certain angles um, compared to each other when they're next to each other. And you can get some really cool effects with it. Like if I bring up the angle limit to say 30 degrees, you get this really weird mesh. And again, I'm going to turn on the wire and draw all edges. And while this might not seem like something useful, when set to flat here, 
you get some really cool, interesting results, and um, you have a little bit more control. As you change the angle limit, you'll get more sort of, um, yeah, because the, uh, I don't know really how to explain it, to be honest with you. The angle limit, because uh, it's lower, you get more and more polygons because the angles between them are um, less extreme, and it doesn't filter them out. Now, I like to go a little bit higher in the setting usually, and then you get these really weird, interesting results. And if you turn on all boundaries, then it will actually try and make uh, proper straight lines between them. So now we've gone from this really weird looking object that you know you can use for whatever, to this really interesting looking mesh, and um, you can use it for other stuff. And this is something I wanted to talk about a little bit because Mesh topology, um, especially when I'm doing stills, I don't really look at it as in it has to be perfect or um, it has to be, I don't know. Um, like, I'm not really interested in having perfect quads unless I'm really rigging and animating something. If I can get away with doing this and getting really interesting results, well, then that's great because I have a really interesting um, thing and I didn't have to put a lot of work into it. And I can prototype ideas really, really quickly. Um, if I were to change the strength of the displacement map, you'll see it nicely adjusts to it and you get really interesting results. You can even animate that and have it all flickery and weird and glitchy and do stuff with that as well. Now there's many different ways to delimit this. Um, you can use seams or sharp edges to sort of control where these edges are. I'm not going to get into it too much because there's no point because this is fairly self-explanatory. But um, I would definitely encourage you to, to check it out and try some really weird, interesting things with it. Now something else I like is if I were to duplicate this and just add in a wireframe modifier. And I'm going to set the offset a little bit higher here. Well, maybe not 50. 25, something like that. What you get is, again, a really interesting looking mesh, uh, wireframe mesh. But what I wanted to show as well is if I turn this off again and I go into the smooth modifier, I'm just going to hide this one for a second. Ah, and I did the wrong one, didn't I? So I'll throw out the smooth. Actually, no, I did. Sorry about that. All right, bring up the smooth. So I've turned off the wireframe modifier here for just a sec. And um, if you smooth this out, then you can get even more interesting results. And especially if you turn off all boundaries. Now, what you'll see is what happens. You get these really weird lines that now turn into this really organic looking thing. And again, if we then turn on the wireframe modifier, you might have to turn off even thickness for it to work. We get a really interesting looking result once more. So. Um, this is almost like modifier magic part two, but I just wanted to show you that mesh topology can be a tool to use as well, and not just something you have to constantly fight. Um, it's something I see a lot when people are starting out with CG, they get told everything has to be quads, and then they're just stuck with that, and they, they don't, you know, they, they can't move past that because they're so focused on making everything quads. Um, you might not finish projects because you get sick of them because you're just not into retopology or not into modeling. And personally, I'm not into modeling that much. So I use topology in a different way. I use it to create interesting shapes and to work procedurally. So um, to actually get back to what we were doing before, knowing that I wanted this sort of low poly looking object. And uh, as you can see, it's the same deal basically. All I've done here is uh, added the planar decimate. And as you can see, it will create all these planar faces and you get really interesting results. Now, some of these stick through the mesh, but honestly, uh, if it renders okay, I'm not too worried about it, especially if it's still. Um, I know some people are just looking at this and going, this guy's crazy and he shouldn't be doing this, but it doesn't matter, you know, it's fine. Generally, what I'll do then, if I want to do more to it, if I want to render it, as you can see, I'll just crop the, uh, the amount of stuff if I want to put displacement on it or whatever. I didn't do it in this case, but um, you never know. And then just added a very simple wireframe modifier to that and you can see it gives it a little bit more of an edge and then when we just render it really quickly we get that result um, and then when we look at the eyes the eyes is basically the same thing I did earlier so I'm going to turn off the modifiers here again just subsurfed round cube um, that are dis that are displaced remeshed to get this really weird sharp looking thing and then I gave it a solidify modifier um, because I actually have two materials in here. One is the inside material or the outside material, which is the glass. So I just separate them out. 
and the other one is just uh, an emission material. So if I darken this glass down, you'll see exactly what's going on. The inside has sort of a glowy feel to it, and the glass sort of refracts that, and makes it look kind of interesting. And put it all together, and it looks really cool. So again, um, is this hor horrible topology? Yes. Is it useful? Also. So to me, it doesn't really matter. I'm not, I'm not too worried about it, especially for a still. Um, these were just sort of meant as lighting tests and just having fun with things. And they came out really nice, I think. So there you go. Um, we'll get into the second one here as well. And a lot of very similar techniques were used. Um, there's some particle stuff going on here, like these cylinders. And um, these were particles that were made with metaballs and some just little particles on there as well. But I'm not too worried about those. I mostly want to talk about this mesh and how we got there. So I'm just going to turn off the particle system for a sec. Are both particle systems. And again, once you start looking at this, you start seeing really familiar things. Um, I have a build mesh in each of these files, which has the original mesh with all the different modifiers on it. So you can take a look at it. So if I grab this again, because like I said before, I tend to just um, collapse them down or apply all the modifiers once I'm happy with the result. And again, localize this and just make this a little bit larger. And we can see the same thing, so I'm just going to turn off all the modifiers for now. And start out with a very basic human mesh, remesh that, and I love the remesh modifier because it gives really cool results. And this one is set to smooth, smooth rather than sharp. I actually forgot to talk about that. So we've got sharp and smooth. So sharp will give us more of a result that we had before in the other one. Smooth will give us a, almost like a grid-like pattern. You can sort of see the algorithm at work when you look at the topology. And um, blocks is even cooler because it can just give you this really blocky sort of look. Um, so if you want to pixelate stuff and make it look really interesting, uh, this is a really great way to go. Now, um, I used smooth, smooth for this, and I sort of liked the way the mouth was going weird here. Um, I first intended to make this something way more creepy and way more crazy, and it ended up being something different, but that's how, how it goes. Then looking at the decimate modifier again, using planar decimation to get these really interesting shapes. And then finally, a wireframe modifier, just on top of that, uh, with some interesting shading to get the, the final look. So there you go. That's actually the final look of the of the mesh. And yeah, it looks a little weird, but once you go into a camera view, it um, looks quite interesting. And um, once you add everything else on top of that, you get the final results. I'm just going to turn off the build mesh again. So when you're downloading the files, the build meshes are hidden. You won't be able to see them. And uh, yeah, that's it. So. I think, where is my main mesh? Did I turn everything off here? That's weird. Anyway, I'm not too worried about it. I'm not gonna, let's reopen the file. So yeah, with all the extra stuff on there, um, the particle systems, uh, you get a really nice, interesting results. And the eyes are basically the same workflow as the previous file. So again, you can just look at this and pull it apart and, and check it out. Um, I just really like this, the way it looked. So that's how it ended up. Now for the next one, uh, I'm going to look at another way of using meshes to do interesting things. And this is something I posted quite recently that people seemed really interested in. So I figured I'd, uh, I'd take a look at it. And um, yeah, I really like this type of stuff. It's it's not that incredibly hard to create once you have a good idea of how you want to do it, but it can yield some really interesting results with some nice lighting and compositing and everything on top. So I'm also I'll supply like I said all these files. So you can just have a look at them yourself. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is um, just drop down the amount of subdivisions. Otherwise, this is going to be really slow for the rest of the tutorial. So let's go open this up and show you exactly what's going on here. So very basic pattern. So I've got a whole bunch of stuff that seems to be moving around. But basically, I've got a camera on a curve that moves around um, to give me some interesting camera positions. So uh, I'm not going to worry about that too much. Some lighting up top. And uh, this is a empty that is linked to a curve that, the, um, that controls the displace modifier. So that's what I want to talk about real quick here is this effect was done using dupliverts and I absolutely love them because you can do some really, really cool stuff with them. 
Um, you can do a lot of the same things with particles, but I like dupliverts because they're really quick to set up and you don't have to deal with particle systems and put in a lot of, um, I don't know, a lot of settings and things to get a very basic result. So what I wanted to show you here is that a lot of this animation is still mesh-based, even though it looks like particles and it was done um, with instancing. It's gonna start from the beginning and again, this always starts with a round cube. I think it's probably the most overused object in, uh, in my library that I use all the time. Um, subdivided it, and uh, normally it's subdivided to five levels, but we'll look at that in just a second. Then again, displaced, and the displace modifier is using, where are we? Oh, there's two displace modifiers. So there's a first displace modifier that gives the mesh sort of a weird, um, gives me a weird base mesh to work with. Then I edge split all of these to uh, split all the edges in between them. Then I'll uh, smooth them out just a touch. So you get a nice little split. And that basically controls the size of the dupliverts. So I'll show you in just a second what happens when I turn them on and off and what the difference really is. Uh, and then that final displace, it's displacing the mesh inside out and through itself and doing just generally really weird things with it. So if I turn off the edge, angle here or the edge split and the smooth real quick and I'm going to turn off the matte cap there we go you can see this mesh looks kind of weird if you turn off double sided you can see most of the mesh is actually inside out and it's moving in a really weird way that's really all that's happening um, it's a fairly simple simple trick but because we have this really weird mesh to begin with um, all the displacement happening now is pushing it inside out and giving you really odd movement and making it sort of look more interesting. So with the edge split, what you can see is when the second displace happens, I'm controlling the size of the um, polygons of the mesh, which in turn helps me control the size of the, um, the dupliverts. So again, this is with the edge split and this is without the edge split. So without the edge split, the dupliverts react a lot more to the size of the faces and with the edge split, I'm actually able to control it a little bit more and the size is relatively smaller to each other. So again, it's all mesh based. Um, and if I crank this up, you'll see it'll start going fairly slow, but it doesn't really matter because as long as it works, it works. And um, if we just turn on the render view really quickly, you'll see that's what it looks like. And then with some compositing, um, I use the, the mist pass a lot to hide some of these back particles you get the effect that eventually uh, is what it is. So again, it's just very simple, neat tricks. Uh, and I like working this way because you can just pro prototype really quickly and change stuff and you know, change if you want to go in here and change the texture of the displace, you can change it to something else and you'll get completely different movement or, um, yeah, there we go. So you can do infinite variations extremely fast and get some really cool results. And looking at this, this might have you know been a really nice one as well. Um, so let's go, actually, let's not render it. Let's go back to what it was. There we go. Um, and then it's just a case of tweaking sort of the, uh, the curve here, having anim animating that and animating the um, empty that's controlling all that displacement and doing all that weird stuff to the mesh. So what seemed like it might be a really complicated effect is actually not all that bad. Um, something else I want to talk about real quickly as well is that dupliverts have a lot of really interesting options. Um, I generally don't use the frames or group options that much. Um, these can, for example, be used to scatter something on a spline, which is really interesting, or on a mesh. And um, these uh, group ones can just yeah, you can enable group instancing. I don't really use it much, so I'm not gonna explain all that much about it. But the difference between the verts and uh, faces is also a really interesting one. If I use the verts one, then you'll see uh, there's no scaling going on. It's just using the scale of the um, instanced thing here. So that's the size of it, of the instanced round cube. And um, what it's doing is just grabbing every vert on that, uh, on that mesh and just putting a round cube in there as well. Um, what you can do is have it use the rotation of the mesh, but seeing that these are circular particles, you're really not gonna notice that much. And by turning on only render, you'll actually get just what is uh, what is gonna be shown in the render, which is really interesting. Now, the faces one is really cool because you can actually have them scale along the faces. 
Now you have a separate scale control that you can use to scale the individual particles by themselves, if you would like. Um, or it just grabs the scale from the particle in here, or from the instance object rather than the particle. Um, but it does scale them up when the faces get larger. So that's why I use this one in this case. Um, and then again, use the edge split just to control it. But if you turn it off, you can see the, uh, and I keep calling them particles, but they're not. The instance objects um, actually have, uh, yeah, have that cool little effect where they grow larger when the underlying um, polygon of the mesh actually grows larger as well. So that one's really cool. Um, again, I do so much stuff with displacement. At this point, if you watched a lot of these episodes, you're probably sick of me using the same things over and over again. But I always find new and interesting ways to do stuff with them. And um, I just always like this this way of using all these modifiers to be able to go back and, and change things and mess around with them. So and one thing that I haven't mentioned before, to make um, these dupliverts actually work, you have to instance the, uh, or you have to parent the, the instance object to the main object before you turn on dupliverts. So be sure to do that before you, you get started with them. All right, and then for the last one, and this is another recent one, I'll actually show you the, um, the animation for this as well. So people are asking me all kinds of questions about this one, how I did it. And um, again, it's another, another iteration of that same workflow. So I'm gonna show you very quickly. Um, basically the same as the last one. I have a, uh, again, a mesh, surprise, surprise, or let's see if we can turn off our dupliverts for now. Again, mesh, round cube that has been subdivided and uh, once more been displaced. And again, the displace is being controlled by an empty that is uh, linked to a curve. So uh, if I haven't said that yet, it's with the follow path constraint. And uh, again, I'm using just the weird topology of the mesh to create the effect that I'm looking for. Now, um, what makes th this one a little bit different is if I turn on only render here really quickly, again, we can see that effect, but it's not quite what I was showing. And um, what I basically did is I grabbed all these three objects, and this is where it gets really interesting, and I duplicated them 10 times in this case. And what I did was I offset each one of the, um, the controllers by one frame. So you can see the animation is offset by one frame. And um, that gives this really weird echo effect. I'm gonna turn on the only render. And basically what I did then for each, um, for each separate instance, I just turned down the scale of the instances. So if we look at them here, um, I don't know if we're gonna be able to see this easily, but I think I just scaled them like this. So here you can see scale is different than this one. So I have different sizes for each mesh here and um, they scale down as uh, as they pr basically progress in time. So you get this really cool effect of this echo with these smaller dots uh, that are still reacting to the size of the base mesh because we're using the dupliverts and the face size to actually control these. So you get l multiple layers of scaling and movement all working together to create this really intricate effect. And again, it's all just based on meshes with really weird topology and pushing them inside out and doing this crazy crap with them and not worrying about uh, not worrying about it and just trying stuff out. So again, you can uh, check this one out for yourself. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's it for this one. And as I was finishing up the video, I realized there was another one and I really wanted to show you guys as well um, that I got some questions about. So I did a series of images uh, like these recently. Just wanted to talk a little bit about the workflow as well because um, it ties into this. Um, because uh, again, it's using a lot of little tricks and stuff for meshes. So let's open that up. I haven't had a chance to clean this file up yet, so I hope everything's in here. But again, uh, you'll get a cleaned up version that you can take a look at yourself as well. So um, you can see first off the same thing I've sort of done. Um, I've uh, cut off the rest of the body because I'm using, I'm actually using uh, subdivision, sorry, micro displacement and um, have to have a little bit of a cleaner mesh. But uh, the cool thing about this is that a lot of this stuff again is done completely procedurally. 
So um, I got a lot of questions asking me if I did this with sculpting. And uh, again, I have to disappoint everybody. It's all again done with modifiers because I just have a really weird way of doing things. So I'm going to turn these all off and give you an idea of where to start. So this is the base mesh and we'll just have a look at that base mesh first and how I got there before I, I get into all the other steps. So I just need to make sure this is number three. Okay. And let's start with number two. Nope. Just have to make sure. There we go. So here we have a uh, basic mesh. And uh, again, this was generated with the add-on that I was talking about earlier. But um, the way I get this mesh is basically by using a Boolean. Now, um, if you've ever worked with uh, people that do things like, well, modelers and people that do things like sculpting and everything, they really don't like Booleans because of the topology. And I'm sort of the other way around. I don't really give a crap about topology, especially for stills. So I can get away with this stuff. And um, basically all I did was create a cube and made sure that this cube was subdivided so if we look at the wireframe and a good way to get like semi decent booleans and topology that isn't really bad because if I move this around, you'll see it can flash and do really weird things. So sometimes you just have to mess around with it and try things to get it to look right. Um, but the way to get a really clean one is sort of match the size of the, um, the polygons on the object that you're booleaning with the, the sort of the size of the polygons of the object that you're you know, taking pieces out or adding pieces to. And I find that gives you generally the best results and you can sort of go from there. So um, with that Boolean done, um, again, it's just messing around with a cube. It's nothing special. I just take out the shape and uh, with all the different um, variations that I did of this, if you followed me on Instagram or somewhere else, um, it's just different shapes and some of them were sculpted, some of them were, you know, displaced and done other things with, but just wanted to show this one. Um, and uh, yeah, I basically just start from there. Then what my next step is, is go into this and you can sort of trick the Boolean if you have, um, if you go into the cube, let's see, I think that's how it worked anyway now. I just need to double check. Yeah, so if you go into the cube, and again, this was even just subsurfed uh, with a simple subsurf, um, and you have all of your polygons selected, and I think this is every time, but I'm not sure. I haven't actually taken the time to confirm this. If you Boolean and make sure nothing is selected on your um, base mesh where you Booleaned, you get the selection once you go into edit mode of the inside of the polygons, which is really awesome because then you can throw them in a, um, in a vertex group and start doing interesting things with it. So again, uh, I'm just gonna deselect it. This is the inside, so this is what I got. I'm just selecting the inside of the face. And if I deselect that, if you look at the displacement, then I've basically hit control plus minus like this um, to make it a little bit smaller. So if I go back and I select the inside here and I do this, I'm basically getting this displacement uh, displacement one and only want to displace the polygons that are not on the edges. So this way I get a, a more, um, a better control of the inside of the face or head or whatever you want to call it at this point. Um, and actually do some interesting things with it. So again, first thing I do is subsurf the crap out of it because, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it makes things easier to have a lot of polygons when you're working um, procedurally. Slower also, but also easier. Then I'll smooth it out. But as you can see, I'm just smoothing out the inside with the displacement vertex group. Um, so you can see these corners sort of get rounded off. And the reason I do that is so I can displace it. And even though this looks really weird and sketchy, um, if you again displace it, this looks really, really terrible. But um, the reason I'm doing this is because if, if I smooth this out, and there's probably a better way to do this, um, but if I smooth it out like crazy, um, when you first use the smooth, you might have noticed that you can only go up to 30, but you can type in pretty much any number of repetitions. But now I get this really interesting looking uh, inside effect, and it's really just messing about. But again, what I wanted to talk about is I'm using this displace um, vertex group and that way I'm able to control just the inside here and do some really interesting things with it. And uh, then all it is is bringing down the subsurf, adding another subsurf with adaptive um, subdivision. So when we finally render, I have different materials. Come on. 
you look at them here, basically just have two different materials and my HDRI isn't loading, so don't worry about that for now. But um, all that's happening is uh, I have an outside material here with displacement on it, and then I have the inside material which has displacement on it as well. Um, and just have a light coming from the, from the back. So I'll supply the file, but I just wanted to add this one in because it's another way of looking at meshes and just not really caring about topology um, to still get a really interesting result from, from what you're trying to do. So um, I'll make sure this file is cleaned up as well and it works when you download it. That's just to give you an insight in how these were created um, under sort of a similar way of doing things. So that's it for this episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it gave you some insight into uh, the way I look at meshes and the way I look at topology and how I use that to my advantage rather than having to fight it and making everything into quads and like really messing with edge loops. I don't like that. It's For me, it's a waste of time for a lot of the stuff I do. Um, but again, if, if I were to rig and animate this, then I would have to retopologize it and make sure it works. Um, the cool part of this as well is if you change, just one last thing here, if you change the size of first displace, why are they all noises? Anyway, I'm not going to change anything. Then you could actually animate this and have it move and do really freaky things inside. And um, yeah, I used that on our project recently, which was a lot of fun. So there you go. Again, thanks for watching. And uh, yeah, until next time, see ya.